afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you had a great Tai Chi class yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I looked at schedule and it looks very rich. And um, um, uh, you must be very prepared to, you know, all very educated about China now because I'm I'm the second to last speaker, right, for your for your whole program. Yeah. Um, and thanks so much for inviting me here um, to talk about healthcare and entrepreneurship. Actually, it's a very uh, big topic because you know the the healthcare system is so huge here. And it's, it's actually pretty messy. So I will show you some photos uh, to give you an idea like what's going on here. Uh, because personally, I'm in the healthcare uh, industry. Um, you know, um, I, I used to study pharmacy in, in China. I, was, um, I used to study in the other competing school with Fudan University, which is Zhao Tong University. So we call our school the Oriental MIT. So because that's a more like engineering and science focused school, and Fudan is more like journalism, literature, uh, li uh, liberal arts uh, focus. Uh, but uh, you know, we were uh, we we were enemies, so <laughs> 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 just like you know, when I went to uh, Harvard, then you know, people across the river uh, from MIT said, oh, you know, those guys are from across the river; they're from the rural area. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> So welcome to uh, China. Welcome to Shanghai. Uh, so uh, before I give you, you know, an idea what's going, what's really going on in the healthcare system, uh, I would like to throw you two numbers. Uh, the first number is this is the total healthcare expenditure uh, for China in uh, three years ago in 2011 because the uh, China Statistics Bureau always, uh, you know, delaying the time to publish, uh, you know, uh, official data. So this is the data that uh, we can get uh, from the public resource, uh, public source. Uh, so uh, the total healthcare expenditure is 357 billion US dollar, which is a huge market. And then, you know, uh, uh, actually the healthcare expenditure account for uh, about five to six percent of the total GDP, but in U.S. probably you know it account for probably fifteen to eighteen percent of GDP. So uh, still a huge, huge potential for the healthcare sector. Um, and then this is the first um, number. This is the second number that I want to give to you. This is the I, I probably uh, probably some of you already have figured out. But that's the per capita uh, healthcare expenditure. It's only two hundred sixty-one U.S. dollar per year per person. And then, you know, given this number, you probably some of you will be very, very, you know, it's like a shocking number. So, wow, this is like so cheap, right? So, healthcare actually is very cheap because it's a highly re regulated sector. The government really, you know, have full control of the price. Um, so that 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 you know, that's the two number that I want to throw to you before I throw all the photos to of uh, you know uh, uh, help you to understand what's really going on. So, okay, so let's see what's behind these two numbers. So um, you know now imagine that you are a patient, you're sick, right? And then you are facing a choice that uh, where do you want to go? Uh, the first hospital or the second clinic? That's a valid choice here. But in U.S., probably it's not a valid choice for you because all of you have family doctors. Uh, when you get sick, the first person you go to is your family doctor. But in China, the healthcare system doesn't provide that. I don't have a family doctor here. So when I get sick. I need to figure out, okay, if I want to go to the hospital next door, or I need to go to a, a top hospital, uh, you know, probably half an hour cab right away. Um, and then I, uh, you know, for me personally, I pay the same price. There is no price difference. I can see any specialist, you know, whenever I want. I just need to go there, waiting in line for three hours, and then I see the specialist, and the specialist give me like two minutes, and then done. And I don't know the specialist at all. And then after I go back home, I, I have no connection with the doctor. And I probably don't remember the doctor's name. And next time, if I need to do a follow-up, if I, I need to go back, then I need to do, do it all over again. And it probably it's a different doctor who's, who's asking me questions or treating me. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the, uh, 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 the first problem that I, I want to, uh, to, to bring up is, you know, uh, so basically there is no family doctor here. Everybody is equal because that's kind of like the, the, the government concern because they want you know national security. Every, uh, they want the healthcare to be equal to everyone. So that's why they open up the whole uh, healthcare system. There is no like tiered um, structure in the healthcare system at all. Um, so of course you know uh, as a result, every of course everybody wants to get the top quality care. 
and the top quality of care is in tier one city like Shanghai here, uh, Beijing, which is the capital city, and also there is uh, Guangzhou, so three uh, tier one cities. Um, and then basically, you know, more than half of the uh, top doctors are uh, focused or concentrated in these uh, three cities. So if I am from a rural area, uh, you know, uh, my, my preference would be I take a train, I go to Beijing, I go to Shanghai because I want the best care because I pay the same price. Uh, the only, you know, uh, uh, the only difference is I need to pay, uh, pay a train ticket and it was worth it, right? So that's what happened. Um, so, you know, people take train to go uh, around China to go to Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou. And then, you know, on the uh, right-hand side, that's, uh, seven, uh, that's 6 a.m. in one of the top hospitals in Beijing because everybody wants to see those doctors. So they line up and then, you know, uh, it's, uh, there's no guarantee that they're gonna get a spot on the same day. So if they don't get a spot, then they have to live ne uh, nearby the hospital and then line up again next day. So it's like, that's what's happening in the healthcare system. And you know, but just by talking about it, I, it's very painful for me. <laughs> I don't wanna go through that. Um, and then this is actually what's happening in the hospital after you got a spot, and then you wait, you wait outside of the uh, clinic room, uh, waiting for the doctor to treat you. And then you're actually waiting with other sick people. And then you know, what if you know people are all having infectious disease? You can imagine that, right? But patients don't really care. They they need to see the doctor. They're there. And you know, some of them we can see like some of them are fighting with each other, just you know, to jump in line or something. It's pretty chaotic. Uh, I would, uh, if you really want uh, to understand, you know, what's going on in the in the healthcare system in China, uh, I think you should have a tour to the hospital and see what's really going on there. Um, and then, you know, there is absolutely no privacy, so everybody is very curious, like, oh, uh, so what the doctor is writing? Uh, why this patient is sick? What's the diagnosis? What's uh, what's the uh, what the <laughs> what medication is this uh, patient taking? So everybody is like looking around. There is absolutely no privacy. And there is no one controlling that because everybody wants to rush in, right? And then, uh, because, uh, you know, so for some of the doctors, they probably treat um, <coughs> 100 patients a day. So everybody is kind of like, you know, waiting and very anxious to get treated. Uh, so the doctor actually end up not spending a lot of time and understanding and uh, giving you a very careful diagnosis. Uh, you know, sometimes the doctor were so busy that they would probably just uh, ask several questions or write a prescription for you, and then you, you go back, and then if something happened, then you need to come back again. So that, because the doctors are way overloaded. So how, that, how are records standardized, if at all? I mean, if you're saying you see one clinician and then come back, that's a different person. Yeah, so basically, uh, uh, so if you go back to the same hospital, mm -hmm. then they have the uh, electronic, uh, electronic medical uh, record. So you have the ID uh, number, which is uh, unique, right? So they pull out your profile, and then they, they pull out your uh, uh, treatment record. Yeah, otherwise, if you go to a different hospital, then you, know, you have to do it all over again. Sorry, yeah, so that's what was happening. And then you know, the hospital system are not, not talking to each other. But I guess this, uh, that's also not happening for U.S., right? No, the hospitals are not really, their system is not uh, connected. Um, and then, you know, after I describe the whole situation, uh, you will probably imagine that, you know, wow, well, you know, doctors are, uh, must be, you know, highly paid and highly respected, right? But that's not the reality. So the reality is, you know, the doctors got extremely low income. Uh, so for a first year uh, graduate from medical school, their salary is about 400 US dollar a month. That's it. How much? 400. 400. 400 US dollar a month. That's uh, for the first year graduate. Um, and then, you know, like cities in, uh, like Shanghai, Beijing, you'll probably see the living standard is, in the, is actually uh, pretty good right here, right? Uh, uh, the living standard is uh, probably comparable to Hong uh, all the other big cities. So uh, the, the, living, the living cost is actually very high. So that's why the doctors are, uh, their social status is pretty low here. So they, you know, when they go to, go to work, they have to take bus because the bus is cheap. It's not because it's convenient, because they're forced to do it, because they don't have the income or they don't have the money to have a decent life. Um, and then, you know, then that brings out another topic that, you know, I don't know, the, the, I, I, I love China, but then that's a problem. Uh, the doctors are forced to take great income. 
um, probably you heard something about it, but then you know because of the reality that they're having really low income, so they are forced to uh, find other uh, income channel uh, to 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 compensate themselves. Uh, so that's uh, that uh, that's what I want to share with you to basically paint the picture. Is that, okay, this is a market that we are facing, and as an entrepreneur, there is a lot of problem to solve. So here we are. Uh, here are the warriors <laughs> or entrepreneurs to save or solve part of the problem. <laughs> um, so this is a slide actually from a McKinsey, uh, a McKinsey uh, talk, uh, just uh, actually just the last month. So basically they laid out um, what's going on in the, in the healthcare uh, sector. So I'm focusing on the entrepreneur uh, side because they actually quote us as the only player for physician and uh, um, and the patient network. Uh, so uh, let's see, like what kind of problem you know entrepreneurs are solving. So the online scheduling and the EMR that's absolutely have uh, have you know impact because you see you know on the photo before we see you know people are lining up you know six a.m. they're lining up. So if there is an online scheduling uh, tool, then that could ease the problem a lot. So there is a several players in that uh, sector who are doing that and they're doing a good job. And then you know the big player Tencent is also they actually just uh, invest huge money into a, a mm, big company or into a healthcare IT company who is only focusing on online scheduling. So they really wanted to figure it out. And then the second uh, sector is the e-commerce pharmacy. So there, uh, the Chinese government gives several license to uh, to entrepreneur uh, to healthcare uh, IT companies uh, to allow them to sell uh, medication online, mostly OTC, uh, over the counter. Uh, medication. So it's actually a pretty crowded uh, uh, sector for entrepreneurs already. And then the third one is <coughs> us. So basically we are building a platform for physician and patient to connect directly so that they can figure it out. Because you know in the in the uh, in the traditional or in the current system, uh, you know the hospital is in a way, institution in a way and government is in a way. But there is no way for the patient to find a doctor and you know talk to the doctor in a convenient way. The only choice they have is the patient, you know, go uh, take the train, fly to big cities, check in, wait, wait, you know, hours after hours, and then see the doctor for two minutes. That's it. That's all the time they get from the doctor. Uh, but then, you know, we want to provide a platform to build a direct connection between doctor and patient, so that they can they can have a very quiet environment to really talk and and concentrate on the, on, on the patient medical condition. And then the last one is also pretty crowded, is, uh, is a personal uh, health care. So you know, the, the first one is focusing on like women uh, period tracker, something like that. And then you know, there's you know, also like health care related Q&A, uh, &A, you know, those kind of <coughs> platforms. Um, and then you can see you know, for the giants, um, uh, which is the fir first row. So, tens uh, so in China, there are three big, uh, big IT giants. We call BAT, B is Baidu. A is Alibaba and T is Tencent. Uh, they all have a blueprint. Uh, you know, uh, like they're trying to figure out how to uh, how to solve problem or how how to make money in the healthcare sector because they all of them know actually this is a huge sector. This is gonna be the next big thing. So you know, they already you know the uh, by, uh, actually all of them already have huge investment in uh, you know buying. Uh, the, the tr traditional players in the healthcare IT sector, and they're actually actively looking for targets. So we, we got approached by mo uh, all of them actually, and then they want to talk to us, and they want to figure it out because of, you know entrepreneur uh, currently the mobile health sector, digital health sector, is is super hot, and a lot of entrepreneurs you know are doing different things trying to solve part of the problem. Okay, so here we are. So um um. So basically, I found a company uh, last year, uh, August last year, with the with the mission or vision really to empower doctors and empower patients. Because currently, you know, doctors have low income; they're powerless, and most of the doctors, uh, you know, ninety percent of the doctors work for public hospitals. Uh, private sector is very very small, uh, uh, mainly due to government regulations and control. They don't want to open the healthcare sector to uh, to to private sector yet. So they only have a small like window to open to foreign investment and, um, and the, the, the capital market. So most of the doctors uh, still work for public uh, hospitals. 
And then, you know, uh, most of the doctors still heavily rely on the reputation of the hospital because when a patient is sick, they choose hospital. They don't choose doctor because they don't, don't know any doctor. So we want to provide this platform to really, uh, you know, uh, help the doctor to build their reputation within the patient that they already treated. So that they are, you know, on the one hand, they have a lot of followers, they have fans, right, uh, who really appreciate or respect them because, uh, you know, the doctor helped them to, to recover or to, to kill the disease. Um, on the other hand, you know, the, the doctor got, uh, had a uh, got to build up his own personal reputation among the patient directly. He doesn't need to rely on the hospital reputation anymore. So as a result, actually, the doctor uh, can be more independent and the doctor have more choice. So that's how we empower doctors. For the patients, you know, uh, uh, currently the patients don't have any choice except that they go to the hospital, check in, weigh, you know, and then they, you know, the doctor treat them pretty badly actually because the doctor is always in a, in a very anxious mood <laughs> because they have to treat a lot of patients. So by providing this mobile uh, platform, the patient actually can talk to the doctor on the cell phone anywhere, anytime they want. Just you know, send send the message to the uh, to their own doctor who know their condition, and then the doctor can respond to them same day when they have time. So actually, that's a, a, a we are doing a simple thing, but it's really it's really powerful. That uh, that's the power for direct connection between patient and a doctor. And then you know um, I don't know why you know people are not doing it. We're the first one who actually who who did it. And now we see, you know, uh, based on our backend data, you know, doctor and patient are super active. They have a need to talk to each other after the patient go back home. The patient, uh, you know, one is they're, they're really uh, asking about, uh, you know, uh, medical questions. But most of the patients are seeking for comfort because, you know, they're sick. And their doctor know exactly what's going on with them. So they want to talk to the doctor. And the doctor is leveraging this platform to build his reputation, and hopefully, you know, the pa uh, based on word of mouth, the patient can refer new patients to to the to the doctor. So that's kind of you know the incentive uh, to help them to keep being active on the platform. Um, and then this is a story that I love to share because you know uh, the, uh, he is a doctor uh, and also a very super active user on our platform. Uh, he used us uh, for more than half year, and he accumulated about uh, roughly about 1,000 uh, patients already on the platform. So um, after using our platform, he feel empowered. He used to work for a, a class three type A hospital, which is the highest rating hospital. So you know his patient source is heavily rely on the reputation of the hospital. So you know he he worked for the hospital, and the patient will naturally flow to him, right? Uh, but then, you know, now he feels that he's ready to start his own studio. So that's a ceremony that we were celebrating him to be really independent. So that's a studio, that, that's a studio, uh, 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 so he, he owned 100% of the studio. And, you know, that's uh, the way, that's one way that, he, you know, he wants to really increase uh, patient satisfaction because he removed all the, you know, the government administrative work and then really only focusing on uh, increased patient um, satisfaction and the clinical outcome. And the patient really, lo really love it. Uh, so that's like the story, uh, that's the first story that we see. And we, because the government is opening up to, you know, encourage doctors to do like multi-location practice or be, uh, you know, a freelance, right? Or, you know, have their own uh, business. So we see, you know, this is a trend. So uh, if this becomes a, a major trend, then our platform will become an enabler for them because they really, they, they need patient. To, 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 uh, to feel empowered to do that, to feel ready to do that. We see some uh, you know, unsuccessful case that you know, doctors quit their job uh, from a public uh, hospital, and then you know, the moment they leave the hospital, they have no patients. And they have to do a lot of marketing and advertisement you know, to basically bring patients, but then you know, the patients don't really trust it. If they do like TV, TV commercials, they do you know uh, advertisement on newspapers. That that looks like shady, right? So you know the, the consumers don't really don't, don't really trust it, unless you really build your reputation or word of mouth uh, among the patients that you treat it. So that's actually what we're doing. Um, and then you know this is a, a famous quote from uh, one of the most successful entrepreneur uh, in China. Uh, he's the founder of Xiaomi. I don't know. It's kind of like the iPhone in China. So they ha they are ambitious to to uh, to be bigger than iPhone actually. Uh, so he said, if the wind is strong enough, pigs can fly. So 
uh, basically, uh, what I want to say, uh, share here is basically the, the the venture capital market is is super hot now. It's the best time ever for entrepreneurs. Um, so for us, we got our angel funding last year, and then we already closed our Series A. Uh, uh, from uh, Chinese funders or outside? Uh, angel from uh, Chinese indivi uh, rich individuals, um, and then uh, for Series A is uh, uh, actually international fund. So we got US dollar. Yeah. So uh, we we also have. Hmm? How much was the Series A? Uh, series A is uh, Series A is about uh, several million RMB, and the Series B uh, is about several million US dollar. So that's kind of like standard. Uh, you know, the current standard um, uh, standard fundraising size for Series A uh, companies here is about five to ten million US dollar. Yeah. So that's kind of like you know. Okay. Yeah. So you're helping doctors. Create private practices. Their own uh, practices is that the idea ultimately? Uh, uh, in this room, I would say yes, because <laughs> <from the, laughs> because personally, I believe because you know uh, one of the funda uh, uh, fundamental um, problem or you know the reason the fundamental reason for the the current uh, for the problems for the current healthcare system in China is because it's it's super controlled by the government. I think it's a it's a public policy failure. So they need to bring market force to the to the to the sector. Uh, you know uh, why? You know the, the uh, you know the U.S. healthcare system is is a little bit better than China. Uh, one of the reasons is really you know because it's it's very um, uh, market driven. You know you have you know you have very mature uh, insurance policies, and then you have a lot of private practice, right? So it's opening up to the whole market. And people are competing with each other. Clin you know, clinicians. Uh, so there is a one company called Zocdoc. I don't know if you you know. Yeah, yeah. some of you know it. Yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, the business model for them is uh, doctors are paying the platform to put their name on it, so that patient can schedule uh, to uh, can do a scheduling on the platform. It's it's not imaginable in China. You know, imagine you know a a doctor only get like four hundred dollars a month, and they're paying our platform to get our platform. No way. There is no way. Yeah. So my so the follow up is who how does the doctor get paid and how does Green Apple get paid? Is the gov is are you still billing the government or is it people paying extra to get the, the It's all out of pocket. Okay. Yeah. It's nothing to do with the government, nothing to do with the hospital. Yeah. So uh, I take it the doctor can bill a lot more than four hundred dollars a month towards Yeah, definitely. It's like definitely that. extra uh, extra income by serving a uh, patient. Mm -hmm. And patients are super willing to pay for it actually. Yeah. Uh, what's your, do you, like, you charge a fee or was it a subscriber's a subscription to your service or how do you generate revenue? That's a good question. <laughs> That's a question from my investor <laughs> and they always want to push me how to, uh, 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 so basically, you know, um, I, uh, I see my company as an internet company now. So the main purpose for us is really to build up user base. Uh, so currently, we are uh, we are the most active um, uh, platform for a physician and a patient in China already, um, but we still need to yet to grow our user base. Uh, so how to make money? That's a <laughs> that's a very uh, that's a very big uh, question. So uh, you know, uh, so currently, basically, patients are paying us, so we help doctor to collect the money. Uh, for example, uh, for a phone call with the doctor. So the patient can request a phone call and the patient needs to pay. So for 10 minutes, we bill uh, about 100 RMB. So it's a, a little bit less than $20 uh, per 10 minute. And then patient uh, pay us. And then uh, we, we tell the doctor, oh, you know, uh, uh, there is a patient who already paid, you know, they, and the patient wanted to talk to you. What is the convenient time for you? And then after the, the phone call, basically we give everything to the doctor. Our role is just help to, uh, to facilitate the call. But uh, you know, uh, uh, some players or some platforms, they take a cut, just like the Apple model. So Apple will take 30%. Uh, so that's kind of like you know, uh, what other platforms are, are taking. Um, you know, that's one potential uh, way for, for us to make money, I guess. Um, you but mean to take a percentage of that $100? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they take 30% of the $100, uh, 100 RMB. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so that that's uh, that's one way to do it. But then you know, um, based on our analysis, um, it's not big enough. So so we are willing to give it up for now, and then you know, uh, because digital health or mobile health is so new that everybody is trying to figure out. 
Um, and then, you know, the business model that uh, we see on the market now is, I would say, very traditional. So I, I love to quote a story from, uh, uh, I always love, I love Google. So I, I love to quote a story uh, uh, of Google. So when Google started the company, right, um, they have no idea how to make money. But they're doing a valuable thing. What they wanted to do is to uh, enable everybody in the world to have access to the right information. And that's what they're doing, and they did it. And it's a valuable thing, that's how they, and then you know, along the way they figure out, oh, actually people are willing to pay for ranking. You know, people pay me and then I rank higher. And then, you know, but, but then you know, they want to be a, a fair platform or a transparent platform, so they will let the consumer or user know, like, this is a paid search, and this is an organic search, right? So that, uh, the business model did, uh, did not get to be figured out the day one. But you know, uh, from day one, they're, they know that they're doing a valuable thing. And we know that we are definitely doing a valuable thing. We're creating value for doctor and patient. That's how, that's how we get started. And I'm sure that we can have a, you know, have a way to, to, to make money or cash out. Yeah. Yeah, ultimately, Google makes the bulk of its money in one form or another from advertising. Is, yeah. that, how, is that how you would eventually envision your money? deriving from in some way, shape, or form? From, from uh, I think that's a possibility, but I don't know. We won't be very, you know, we won't, uh, we won't uh, do like direct advertisement for, say, like pharma companies because they all have a need to advertise their, their, medic, uh, their product, right, or medical device companies. Uh, I think that's too intrusive for the users. So that uh, no, uh, number one principle is uh, user satisfaction for us. So the user needs to to feel like you know they love our platform, uh, and then you know within that uh, within that uh, principle, then we can I can decide you know how we can make money. I think how we make money is a secondary question. How we can create value for the user is the absolute number one um, focus for us. Do you do you have a way, or will you have a way in the future of ranking the doctors by um, by reputation or uh, or user response? Yeah. Patient response. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we're definitely on the way to do that. Uh, so uh, to be able to have a fair um, result of the ranking, we need uh, we need a user base. So that's why we are on the way. But that's definitely very valuable. Yeah. What sort of data do people enter into the system? I mean, are any, is any medical data stored in yeah. it or entered? Yeah, that's a good question. So basically, currently, because we are we, we position ourselves as a communication platform, we don't uh, we don't position ourselves as a, a medical record uh, tool or whatever, right? So we don't connect with the his system at all, the hospital information system at all. So it's a light communication tool. So information we collect is patient name. Uh, uh, their agenda, uh, their uh, their location, so which province they uh, they're from, and then you know when they ask questions, we uh, we give uh, we give user option to tell the doctor which disease they have, um, and then also upload photos if they want to, but they it's optional. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to understand the, the business model and the, the connection between the doctor and the, uh, the patient. Mm -hmm. Um, is your service simply to set up that initial consultation, uh, I assume over a mobile phone, mm -hmm. between the patient and the doctor? Um, uh, does the doctor then have the option of having a face-to-face -face meeting with the patient? Or does he simply, he or she, refer the patient to some other clinic? Yeah, so the our model, uh, so basically we, we chose, a, um, uh, how to say, um, a moment to enter this, uh, or one point to enter this market is uh, we only have patients who already see the doctor. So we only do follow ups. We don't do initial consultation because if it's initial consultation, then you know the patient will have expectation uh, for diagnosis and treatment option, and uh, that's not legal in China. But the government has not opened uh, online diagnosis and online treatment option um, yet, so it's illegal. So we only do follow ups. Thank you. I have a broader question about the healthcare system here. It seems to me that you can go study in the States and get an MBA, and there's almost a guaranteed return on that investment. You can come here, and the possibility is there to make a lot of money. If you, as you described, the salaries are so low, yeah. uh, it seems like there'd be very little incentive for me to 
come back to China if I studied for a degree yeah. in the States. Perhaps I took on debt. Who knows? Um, <laughs> I wonder sort of systemically what the government is doing to change that. They must be thinking about it. And just from my perspective, being here and, you know, um, to be frank, seeing the degree of pollution, like there has to be a worry about what sort of health care needs that's going to bring about in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. Is the government worried about that? Is it doing anything to think about uh, readjusting the salary system or the incentive system for people to become doctors? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that becomes a forever question for the government. And I think there are several forces, right? Uh, uh, so one force is like they're shouting for the last 10 years, like, you know, they need to increase the salary of the doctor, blah, blah, blah. And there is another force saying that, like, oh, you know, all the doctors are public servants. They should not get paid, uh, you know, that much. Um, so they should focusing on providing service, public service to the to the population. So you know the the basically the, the, the debate has been going on in the last ten years, and there is no result. So the government is trying to solve the problem, and I think um, you know uh, opening up to entrepreneurship and also uh, private sector is part of the solution. So you know uh, three years ago, uh, you know just you know when I just moved back to China, uh, they opened up to officially open up to foreign um, investment for private hospitals. So uh, there are several hospitals, you know, before they need to work with uh, a local government or they need to uh, work with local government-owned hospitals w uh, with a minority shareholding structure uh, for the foreign investment to come in and then establish. So, you know, the foreign investment doesn't have any incentive to do that because, you know, the local government and the, and the foreign, uh, and the, the, the local hospital end up collecting all the all the money, right? So, and they, they also, um, uh, basically, the sector is highly regulated, and then for our sector, for the digital health sector, the government is absolutely encouraging, encouraging it. Yeah. So I got invited by uh, people from Beijing uh, several times to become an advisor for the committee because they really wanted to figure it out, and you know they want to figure out how you know um, the TMT technology, simple IT technology, can help to break through, to bring breakthrough to the to to the sector because they haven't figured it out. It just strikes me so we heard like life expectancy is up, and so it makes me think that that's a way of sort of masking problems that could come ahead of time. We just heard about the education system and how ambitious the plan was to yeah. change that. Has there been anything mounted like that, sort of a, a national, that was a national campaign to change the curriculum or get more people into school for longer? Nothing like that, it sounds like, has happened for reforming the healthcare system. Uh, for the healthcare system, I think one is the government is really aiming for full coverage of insurance, uh, social insurance, uh, and they are doing it. Uh, I think they already achieved that on paper, but then, you know, in reality, uh, you know, if I got covered and the government only paying me $100 per year, that's equal to nothing, right? right. Uh, but then, you know, I got covered by $100 and the government achieved their goal. So that's one thing. The other thing is they are trying to build a tiered uh, structure for the healthcare. So they they really they are really hoping or wishing uh, or praying that you know uh, people are willing to go to the local clinic and then you know uh, the local uh, the, the the junior doctors are going to refer them to a big hospital so that big hospitals don't need to be so crowded, right? But then you know because they haven't uh, figured out the, the uh, insurance policy or uh, the pricing strategy, so most people still end up going to big hospitals because you know they they want to seek for top uh, top quality care. Yeah, but they're really doing it. They're trying to. Can you can you walk us through the the process of becoming an entrepreneur from your point of view, your mm -hmm. personal point of view? Mm -hmm. You came. You said three years ago. You came back. Was that right after you got your MBA? Yeah. Um, what? Can you walk us through just from the very beginning how one such as yourself becomes an entrepreneur? What's the very first step? What's the second step? And so, you know, just just broadly speaking. Yeah. So, um, basically, I want to become an entrepreneur um, when I was a kid. I guess I always I know that I want to build my own own business, and I um, and then when I was um, in Boston, uh, I I was actively looking uh, or studying the digital health sector in the U.S. Right. So the first company I encountered, which is also a case uh, in in my class, is American Well. I don't know if any one of you actually are aware of this company. Uh, the company is is founded by two um, Massachusetts General Hospital physicians who is also Harvard Medical School uh, graduates. So they founded this company, and then you know basically they're they're building a platform for doctor and patient, but mostly for video video a uh, video chat. Um, and then the business uh, the business model is like uh, insurance company cover 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 the. Uh, 
the service, right? So the insurance company are willing to pay the doctor to pay for their time. And the doctor got very flexible because you know the doctor can be in Florida for vacation, and then the patient wants to see, uh, want to talk to the doctor, and the doctor can use their platform to to communicate with the patient, and the doctor get paid. So the doctor actually get paid higher than the doctor was physically in a hospital. So of course, doctors are incentivized to do it. Um, and then for the patient, they don't need to drive you know, one hour, 40 minutes to go all the way to see the specialist. So they, they love the platform. And then for the insurance company, you know, they got to reduce the emergency room you know, uh, the ER incidents, right? And then, you know, after the, they, they run a model and see, oh yeah, that's a way for me to save money, to save costs, why not? So then, you know, it's a valid business. So they actually, they're quite successful uh, uh, by then in Massachusetts, and, and then I think they roll out to the to, to the whole US. They were pretty successful, uh, successful in several states. Uh, so that's the first company. And then, you know, also like uh, companies like Patients Like Me, Health Tab, they got a lot of media coverage, right? So it's like, oh, wow, you know, the, these are like typical uh, IT technology uh, from the Silicon Valley, and then, you know, got to uh, uh, got to be introduced to the healthcare sector, and it's actually very powerful. So I start to realize, you know, that's actually one way to to help to solve part of the healthcare problem. And then, you know, personally, I I, I am from the healthcare sector, so I always want to do something in the, in the healthcare sector. So coming back, you know, a group home had an opportunity here. Uh, you know, it's kind of like a risk-free entrepreneurship uh, experience. So I, w I was a running part of the operation for them in tier three. Uh, city. I was in charge of two provinces, so my role is basically I was an entrepreneur in residence. So I, uh, my role is to build up the whole business, hiring people, train them, tell them what to do, you know, get deals, approve them, get uh, you know, edit edit a deal, put down a line, and 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 sell it, right? So that's kind of like the whole process that I went through. Uh, I learned a lot, and then I I became a pharma sales rep. <laughs> I I um I basically uh, I I have my own territory. I have my own uh, doctor customer that I need to sell uh, a, 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 you know my product to. So I was doing like detailing call every day because that's the best way for me to understand how doctors think, what what doctors are thinking about, and you know that's the best way for me to figure out what's the pain point. So I did it for a half year, and then you know I got promoted to be in charge of the sales operation. For, for for one of the biggest business, and then I did I basically I did several roles like marketing, uh, marketing sales, business development, uh, M and A, and then you know I started my own company. Yeah. How did that work? Like, what was the first step in actually getting the financing? Uh, uh, that one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so financing. Um, uh, so basically, uh, my angel is uh, is my friend. And also my mentor. So I, w I have been talking to him for almost um, one year. Mm -hmm. So we were always constantly brainstorming about ideas, right? So he's also very interested in uh, and think that you know the mobile health sector has huge potential. So we have been talking, and then you know one day, actually, yeah. So the uh, um, the interesting thing is actually my inspiration um, is from a, um, a Uber copycat in China. It's called Didi Da Che. I don't know if you know it. So basically, it's a, it's a, a you know Uber, right? Yeah. So Uber is very popular in the yeah. states, and then there is a company copy the Uber's idea, but then you know the car is all uh, uh, taxis. So they basically you know on the one hand are taxi drivers, and on the other hand are consumers. So basically, what they did is simply to connect cab drivers and the consumers, and then you know it's really powerful because at that time I have to travel to Beijing. It's painful to get a cab in Beijing, and you have to <laughs> wait in line, you know, blah, blah, blah. The traffic is so bad. Um, and then, you know, one day I heard about this app and I, I use it. So I, I use the app when the app just launched in the market for a, a month. So it's a, pr a pretty primitive, but it served my purpose. I got, I got my uh, taxi and then, you know. Mm. So, and then, you know, at, uh, after one month, uh, the government said, okay, uh, you know, uh, the cab drivers cannot use, uh, cannot use the app. Because mm -hmm. it's you know basically uh, you know it's it making the whole like uh, cab system very chaotic uh, because people who really want to get a cab waiting on the road cannot get a cab because the cab is all going there to uh, you know get someone who will use the app right and then you know after after like one month uh, 
uh, messy situation, uh, you know, uh, amazingly that, you know, the app survived, mm -hmm. and then more and more people start to use it. And that actually give me, um, make me think, is that, okay, actually this app uh, damaged the interest, you know, from the cap company, uh, which are all state-owned uh, state uh, enterprise, and also the government re really doesn't like, like it. But then you know uh, why it's uh, why it's still there and why it's thriving is because it's really creating value for the user. Who are the user? The cab drivers and the, the consumers. Uh, cab drivers got double their salary uh, every month because you know the uh, <laughs> the consumers are willing to pay to 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 get a cab, and then you know uh, uh, the consumers are willing to use it because they got a cab from the app. Otherwise, they cannot get one, or they need to wait a long time for, for to get a cap. So it really creating value, right? So it's like, oh, wow, this is very powerful. And this, uh, you know, if uh, something can be done over there, why cannot something similar be done in the healthcare sector? Because it's, you know, in some way, it's actually very similar. Because it's a highly regulated sector. Most of the hospitals are state-owned, uh, state-owned uh, hospitals, and then the government is in the way. But then, you know, there must be, you know, the, the direct connection between patient, uh, patient and doctor must be very powerful. That's the moment that I decided to start a company. And then, you know, when I have the idea, then the money comes in, you know, the angel is, re is ready to write a check anytime. And then I start to look for um, my co-founders because I, I'm not a coder myself. I study pharmacy. So, and then, you know, the, the, the good thing is I was, uh, I was from a competing school from Fudan. So I have a lot of engineer friends <laughs> who are my college mates. So I find my CTO who, uh, you know, uh, he is my <coughs> college mate. Yeah, and then, you know, and then we find a designer. So I put a, the whole team together and they start to build the app. Yeah, that's how we get started. Was it ever in doubt that you would have to go to, maybe not Harvard, but to a business school in the States? Was that always, I mean, how important is that to entrepreneurs here getting into the States or going to the UK to get a business degree? Um, that's, uh, yeah, I know that I always want to go to the States for uh, two years. I think ma uh, the main reason is really I want to give myself uh, some time off to really think, figure out what I wanted to, to do with my life. That's why, yeah, I applied MBA, and then you know that's uh, kind of like an environment that I'm I'm I'm, I'm so strange about because I have no idea what's going to happen. So I think that's the big uh, that's the best environment for me to really you know to, to think internally what mm -hmm. I wanted to do. Yeah. So in your uh, taxi comparison there, there there was quite a bit of government pushback against against that sort of Uber for China model. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but from what you've described, it sounds like uh, Beijing has been a little bit more on board with, with your business model, which is an avenue for essentially increasing the salaries of doctors and sort of going around uh, the way that the system is set up. So I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on how and why the government seems to be on board with your idea, or if it was always that way, and if it, there were you know, there had to be some convincing initially, or, or kind of how that process worked. Yeah, that's a good question. So in China, um, if, you, if you zoom in, there are actually a lot of governments there are central government, there are local government, there are a lot of local governments, right? So the interest of party basically one is the central government. And then if we're talking about Shanghai, then it's the uh, Shanghai mayor. And then there are the hospital head for those top hospitals. So these are uh, these three are top uh, stakeholders. And then you know from the from the head of the central government or you know from the, the head of the Ministry of Health, uh, his goal is really to open up. Because you know, uh, healthcare reform in the last ten years is a failure, and you know they, they definitely admit it, and they know that they have to do something about it. So, so they launched several um, several policies. One is they really uh, open it up officially to doctor to do multi location practice. So before you know the doctor is stuck with one hospital. So doctor need two licenses to practice. One is a doctor license, which is understandable, and the other uh, license is a, a license to practice in this hospital. So outside of this hospital, physically, the doctor is illegal to practice. So that's the that's the previous uh, policy. So current now, you know, they open up. So basically, if the other hospital had give you a uh, permission to practice in other location, then you are it's it's illegal for you to to do that. So they're opening up. So that uh, you know, I uh, theoretically, as a doctor, I can practice in a lot of hospitals. I can even practice in private hospitals, uh, which are higher paid, and the doctors are incentivized to do that. 
Uh, that's the first policy. The second policy is the uh, you know Beijing is doing a trial, or uh, a pilot program to allow doctor to uh, start their own business or start their own clinic. So they're they're doing the, that pilot in Beijing. They're not really ready to roll out to the whole China yet, but they're they're going there. They know that you know the market force is powerful enough to to bring breakthrough to the healthcare reform. So central government is very incentivized to do it. So that's why they, they love entrepreneurship. It's like, okay, you guys, please go ahead. You guys, you guys are smart guys. You figure it out, right? You help us to figure out. So that's what's happening over there. So we got endorsement from the central government. For the local government and the, for the uh, the hospital head, actually the hospital head for the state-owned enterprise. I think is the only bottleneck for the for the uh, for the healthcare reform. But they're so powerful. Uh, they, you know, they're a powerful public servant, and they're very powerful. Um, um, and also, you know, their pay is actually pretty high. I would say. What did you say? Hospital head for the uh, for the uh, state-owned uh, hospitals. Uh, and, you know, because they have power. You know, in China, you know, uh, politicians want to do politician uh, because power uh, means money. But in the U.S., it's the reverse. R only rich, rich people will apply, uh, you know, to uh, want to become a politician and want to save the, the country. <laughs> but in China, it's the reverse. So you know, people want to become a politician because they, they think that's the best way to make money because they have power and you know, blah blah blah. Um, so um, um, uh, basically, the, the the whole direction is going against the hospital head. But you know, uh, uh, why is not uh, why the reform is not happening now? Is because uh, they, uh, you know, they have uh, their resistance is uh, is kind of working, but they will, uh, they will, um, how to say? They, um, I think they will be broken, at sometime soon. And, and at, at any point, the central government could step in and break that. It, it is, it, it, there is still that that power there. It's just they're resisting more to the, to the, more private folks like like you going in and trying to do your own thing. Yeah. Okay. That's exactly. That's yeah. So do they view you and Green Apple as trying to make the current system work better through, mm -hmm. through digital platforms? So, yeah. so they like you. Yeah, definitely. So even the you know so the the only uh, the only person or the only stakeholder that I, we have to worry about is hospital head. If you do the whole analysis, right? So and then so the you know um, uh, as a brave girl, I actually <laughs> know several several hospital heads. So I talk to them. I sit down and, and, and talk to several of them. And then uh, surprisingly, actually, they are pretty, uh, you know, um, I would say like 10 to 20 percent uh, hospital heads are welcoming or embracing, embracing the train because they see that's one way to, um, for them to build their competitive advantage. So if you put yourself on that, on that position, you, uh, uh, basically your goal is to, I want to be the biggest, uh, biggest or the, the best public hospital. Uh, among other public hospitals, right? My, I'm worried about competition. Uh, who is the other public hospital? Uh, but then, you know, in China, because for the patient, if the uh, the patient come to my hospital versus coming to the, the hospital next door who is competing with me, the patient ends up paying the same thing. So it's it's not uh, the patient is indifferent. So I need to have an advantage to uh, give the patient an extra reason to come to my uh, to come to my hospital to you know to do surgeries to blah 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 to, you know because that's my revenue income, right? So, uh, so our platform is end up being one way for them to retain patients and attract more, more patients. So they're actually seeing it as a positive thing. And then, of course, the rest of the, of the hospital heads are still trying to figure out what is mobile health. It's like, oh, okay, well, we're indifferent, you know, whatever you know, doctors are doing. So they're indifferent. So how did they react to the, to the private hospitals coming? Because I would think that's where they would get the most agitated. Is that a big public policy fight? Exactly. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, actually there is a lot of tension between private hospitals and uh, and the public hospitals. Uh, so um, that's why you know um, private hospitals have several bottlenecks. One is they have a, a, a lot of problem hiring good doctors um, because you know the only way the only advantage the private hospital have is uh, high pay, but how much higher you can pay. Because you know you're, you're comparing with the on the table salary and the great income, and then, you know some top doctors actually you know their great income is a lot, so you cannot actually end up offering a super competitive package. 
And then, you know, for the, for the public hospitals, they also offer, because they are public servant, the doctor are public servant, so they, they actually, they're entitled to a lot of social benefits, which a private hospital cannot provide. So, you know, that, that's why they have a problem. And then, of course, without top doctors, they don't have patients, so, yeah. I have two questions about how um, the Chinese culture regards two things. The first is just healthcare generally. We've heard from so many business people who are interested in investing in medical device companies or pharmaceutical companies. So mm -hmm. there's that, but it sounds like that's only like skin deep. There isn't, I mean, that's maybe just a business opportunity. So yeah. I'm just interested in like how that's changing. Um, and then mm -hmm. the other is privacy. Like we saw those photos that you had there and it seems like in the States, the barrier to a system like yours might be HIPAA concerns, concerns about privacy. Do those concerns exist here as well? Do you, when you talk to patients or doctors, is there a desire for there to be more of a barrier um, to keep those conversations private? How much do you have to worry about privacy here? Yeah, so I, I will ask the, uh, the the second question first. So uh, basically, um, so um, so that's why that that's actually one reason why I decided to come back to China because China the healthcare system, all the patient doctor have very very different uh, needs compared to the uh, the needs of uh, the, uh, of doctors and the patients in the U.S. Um, the healthcare system is pretty uh, primitive, I have to say. And then you know people are uh, the patients are still worried about uh, whether they can get a good doctor to to, to treat them. Their uh, you know privacy is not their top concern at all. Uh, that's why you know you are a patient, then you know all the patients are waiting around you to see your diagnosis and and the treatment options, and you don't mind because you, you are satisfied because the top doctor is is giving you diagnosis. So uh, in that sense, you know it's a very very different market, very very uh, different needs. So the government, you know, it's, uh, the hyper complaint is, is not a, a top concern right, yeah. <laughs> for, for the government at all. I think the government is still trying to be like a fair system, uh, accessible to everybody um, kind of uh, system. Yeah. So for the first question, um, uh, so for investment in the in the you know traditional healthcare sector, uh, we see actually when I was doing a Series A fundraising. Um, uh, basically, you know, there are two type of uh, VCs who are very active. One is traditional healthcare VC because they're looking for uh, deals that are have much higher upside and uh, looking for different risk uh, profile, I guess, because you know, uh, internet companies have very different uh, risk profile compared to traditional, you know, uh, drugs and uh, and device. Um, and then, you know, the second type is TMT companies. Uh, and then you know, there is no perfect um, investor for mobile health for now because the TMT guys don't understand healthcare at all. They don't understand uh, you know, uh, like, uh, what exact value you are creating for doctors and the patients or for the, for the healthcare. They only care about your user number, you know, your, daily, your daily active users, blah, 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 those, those numbers. Right? And then for the healthcare guys, they have no idea about internet. So they, they are forcing you to to build a model uh, to tell them how to make money. So you know, th there is, th uh, yeah, it's kind of a painful, <laughs> painful <laughs> process actually. Uh, 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 previously to do, um, uh, but but then you know we're lucky to get someone who really appreciate us and uh, actually give us a term sheet after 20 minutes. I talk to the partner, and then we sign term sheet within 48 hours. So <laughs> yeah, so we got lucky. Well, you mentioned that the BAT evolved. Talk to you. Gotten any inquiries from U.S. companies as well? Um, that's my one. I have that question. And okay. This is a sidebar. I hope people don't mind, but I'm also interested. Since your previous life was with uh, this Groupon venture, just a quick synopsis of how they're doing here. I'm curious. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So, um, so I talk about Groupon because that's very simple. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so basically, they start having a 50-50 joint venture with Tencent. Um, and then after, um, I think, nine month operation, then uh, 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 Groupon actually sold all the shares to Tencent. So Tencent owned the 100% uh, shares of uh, Groupon in China. And uh, mm, so Tencent, I think, ended up uh, deprioritizing the group buying uh, business because they, uh, you know, the, 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 gaming, the gaming business is still their uh, main income. And it's actually a pretty, um, how to say, an uh, easy way to make money <laughs> compared to the, to the group buying because for the group buying business, it's very operation heavy. You, you need to have, you need to manage like a thousand, sell, uh, thousand sales reps and then, you know, basically getting, getting um, deals. So that's uh, very heavy. 
And then, oh, what's the first question? Sorry. Oh, just I was curious. You could had um, interest from U.S. Oh, uh, yeah, U.S. Uh, yeah, so basically I also have, uh, you know, I, I know several uh, people or mentor or investor in the Silicon Valley, and we do get a lot of interest from them, actually. Um, and one of them uh, actually is interested in our model because he, also, he is also interested to copy our model to India. <laughs> That's why he wants he want to be on the board, he wants to understand how we work, he wants to put money in. Um, but for us, we actually, uh, for now, we are only focusing on um, uh, uh, VC firms that have China expertise because we, we still need a lot of help to, to, to grow the company. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Sure. Lady first. Oh. <laughs> sorry, um, this is quick. I had a question about how perceptions in China for Western medicine have changed. Because I think before coming to China, if you had mentioned healthcare in China to me, I would have been thinking about like the medicine shop that we visited mm -hmm. on Monday, which was like silkworms, like dried silkworms and roots and that kind of thing. And I'm, I'm actually really surprised to hear that, that we're talking about you know, more kind of modern Western drugs. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that more accepted now, or are people still kind of wary of it? Yeah, I think it's more accepted now. Just to look at, um, if you go back all the way back to medical school, uh, the ratio between traditional Chinese medicine school versus um, a, a regular uh, a regular medical school is, you know, there are, I don't know how many schools, um, there are probably three, four, like, oh no, no, actually more than that, probably four or five big uh, medical school uh, system or medical schools, right? And then one of them is traditional Chinese medicine. So that's kind of the ratio, one out of, I don't know, 20%, 20%, 30%. Yeah, it's still, I think some of the people still like uh, 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 believe in traditional Chinese medicine because they, 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 they feel like it has uh, less side effect, uh, but then it's not proven. So I think the majority uh, still, you know, the, uh, welcome Western medicine and it's, it, you know, you have clinical data, blah, blah, and, uh, you know, the pharma companies are educating, educating the, the, the market. They're spending a lot of money. Yeah, so. Um. Talking about the um, the model that's becoming used in the U.S., where an insurance company might pay to have a video consultation or something like that, um, do you think that model has promise here, either being funded by or, or, or the, the money coming from an insurance company or even from direct users of a platform like this, or say, you know, I'll be willing to pay even more than a hundred if I can do this as a video conference and get diagnosed. I mean, do you think that sort of model could possibly work here, or are there barriers that are different from the states that might make that impossible or not, not likely? Mm, I would imagine, you know, the, the, the biggest barrier is, uh, is the private insurance, because, you know, the commercial insurance is not, is not uh, there yet at all. You know, I mean, the, the, the big uh, insurance uh, con conglomerates are, you know, still, still trying to figure out. They haven't figured out, you know, the, 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 the right product for the Chinese population, I guess. Yeah, so that's the biggest bottleneck. And then, you know, the second uh, potential problem um, that model can face probably is, um, well, depending on how much out of pocket uh, the patient needs to pay, um, I think the, the, the general consumers online still don't want to pay, uh, don't want to write a huge check. Yeah, because internet is mostly free here. Content is free. No one wanted to pay. pay uh, no one wanted to pay here. And a subscription model for me, I never believe in it. I mean, I never pay anything for subscription. I never buy any app on Apple. <laughs> tell journalists that. So I'm, I'm very Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> So is it accurate to say that the power of what you're doing is building this huge membership profile of both doctors and customers? And, and so you're that far ahead of anyone else who might try to come into the space? Is that the value that you're offering mm -hmm. future yeah. investors? And Yeah, uh, you mean scale, right? Scale yeah. is definitely one of the, the entry barrier for our, sec uh, for our sector or for our model. So I believe, you know, if it's a platform, uh, you know, most of the platform is like a winner take all market. So if, you know, the, uh, most of the, you find out, out like, oh, most of the doctors are on this platform, you won't spend, you know, waste your time on another platform. And there is definitely a network effect. If most doctors, if, you know, if I'm a doctor, uh, all of you are a doctor, and, you know, all my peers are on this platform, why should I bother to be on another platform? 
Uh, when the uh, when, when the when the patient pays you the ten uh, excuse me hundred hundred one for ten minutes, is that price regulated by the government? Maybe uh, or maybe no. The, actually, not really. It's uh, well. So we see. Um, uh, so that price is kind of like market price, right? So uh, we put that price on uh, mainly because uh, one of the player who existed, uh, who actually started uh, eight years ago, uh, they uh, they charge uh, one hundred fifty RMB per fifteen minutes, and it's simple math, right? So ten minutes is one hundred quad, and I said, like, okay, let's put ninety nine quad. <laughs> are there are so, there any parts of the uh, of the healthcare system, uh, or excuse me, the system about doctors that are not regular, not price regulated by the government. Other than you know, that are like that. I mean, that are at least somewhat not regulated. Um, I think uh, well, it's not about healthcare. It's about internet sector. So internet sector is the least regulated uh, sector. Um, because, you know, I mean, uh, I'm sure BAT is a big taxpayer for the government. And the government's like, wow, you know, internet is super powerful and we need to let it flourish, right? So that's why they don't have any regulation uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the internet sector. And we, we, are, we happen to be uh, internet plus uh, healthcare. So that's why. But then, you know, for the traditional healthcare sector, the, gov the government is definitely playing a role, controlling the whole price. You know, they, they control like how much you charge for MRI, you know, how much you charge for uh, a medication, how much you charge for a uh, medical device, the surgery, blah, blah, blah. Everything is, is regulated. And then, you know, currently they're forcing the hospital to charge zero premium. Yeah. I, I have one more, I'm sorry, I have one more follow-up too. Would it be legal for, uh, for, uh, for you to hook up with doctors outside the country? We, uh, we are already doing it. <laughs> so we have doctors from Taiwan, we have doctors from US, actually, yeah, we, we have several doctors from uh, uh, MGH, uh, Cleveland. Um, you know, th they are interested, uh, they're personally interested in uh, patients in China. And then, you know, there are, you know, several, uh, some, you know, super wealthy um, uh, Chinese who don't have connection in the States and who want, who need to leverage a platform to find doctors. Yeah. So we're seeing some big companies in the States getting into healthcare. Um, Apple is making moves to do it. Um, we give so much information to Facebook that it would seem natural that that would probably come next. Um, we heard from a professor a few days ago that BAT will often bigfoot these smaller companies, that it will say, oh, here's a real opportunity. Why don't we just utilize the huge membership base that we have to get into this sector ourselves? Mm -hmm. Do you worry about that? And what protections do you have as an entrepreneur trying to build a base, trying to build a company uh, faced with perhaps the prospect of a company like one of these big three mm -hmm. uh, sort of saying we're maybe far ahead of you because of how many people we have using our system, we can just do this already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's actually, uh, the, um, and, you know, needs to do a lot of analysis, right? So I just give a snapshot of what I think about it. Uh, so basically, uh, BAT have very different strategies. So for Baidu, because it's a search engine, right? So they don't have um, on the ground operation. So it's not possible for them to do any, but we have a Salesforce, we roll out, you know, we're kind of like uh, the group buying model. So we're kind of uh, operation heavy. So I don't think they would do on their own. Same for Tencent. Tencent is a game company. Most of the revenue is from virtual goods or you know selling you know weapons in a game, right? So uh, they they won't do that. That's why they actually end up buying a lot of companies who uh, who are operation heavy because they won't do it on their own. Uh, for Alibaba, I think they are mostly um, targeting uh, the the main purpose or the driver for them to enter the, uh, to enter the sector is for the Alipay because they you know if uh, they uh, move all the transaction. Uh, revenue to Alipay is huge. Uh, even if they only take like, I don't know, 0.1% of the total healthcare expenditure, that's a huge number. So that's why they're doing it. I, I don't think they are uh, intrinsically uh, care or uh, want to solve problems for the healthcare sector. I think they're really uh, looking, uh, looking for the, the payment.
Yeah, so it's, it's more for the financial, uh, financial side. And then for Tencent, uh, they also have WeChat payment. So that's also one goal, one driver for them to really enter the sector. So, that, uh, you know, uh, so the, the one investment they did is for the online scheduling company. Um, you know, if the online uh, scheduling company got connected with the his system in a hospital, then they uh, naturally they can actually get into the uh, in hospital payment. So, you know, the patient can pay, you know, all the service fees, the medication fees, surgery fee through, uh, you know, their payment gateway. And that's, a, that's huge. That's definitely huge. So if Alibaba tomorrow like came up with a model much like this, you know, co copied the model, like what could you do? I mean, what's your what sort of legal protections do you have over this idea or this this system? Mm, I don't think there is any legal protection because you know IP protection, business idea is not protect. Idea is cheap, so everything is execution. You know, as a as a huge company, well, actually, as a matter of fact, our Angel, uh, one of our Angel is the personal assistant for Jack Ma. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know if that's the good news or bad news, yeah. but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just had lunch uh, with him actually before this meeting. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I I guess he he knows Jack Ma, and uh, you know the the reason he messed in is. I won't do it, and then you know, even if they decide to do it, I guess uh, because everybody is still trying to figure out the business model and how uh, uh, how you know uh, how company mobile company make money. So I don't think they're gonna uh, make a decision uh, to enter the market uh, now. Um, but then you know, once they figure out, then we are already too big. <laughs> we're, we're we will be the biggest platform. So yeah. Um, where do you see the, the end game for your company? I mean, do you have ambitions to just grow the company uh, to a large size, get it listed uh, on a stock exchange, or if someone came along and offered you a tremendous amount of money and could just cash out, <laughs> what, what motivates you? you know, what's your long term vision for the company? Um, I, I think, you know, I that, that's. Um I don't know. Um, my my personal preference or my dream is definitely to let this company run forever, because I know it create value. Um, I know that you know users need us. So you know that's why I find a company at the beginning. If I I build a company for sale, then you know I can do something else. I don't need to do it because uh, it's not. Uh, this is not a very easy market. There is a lot of problems to solve. Just like uh, you know when Alibaba start uh, started the e-commerce platform, uh, you know the the ecosystem is not ready at all. Uh, I think it's really Jack Ma who is driving. Uh, driving, driving the wheels, right? So you know, uh, you know, for e-commerce to be valid, uh, one, you need payment. You need online payment, and there is no online payment before. You have to, you know, work with those uh, big banks, right? And then, you know, th that's the moment that you know, Jack Ma figure out, okay, I need to have Alipay. I need to have my own pay payment gateway to solve that pain point because it's a bottleneck. And that's one, one, one. And then the second is logistics, right? So I mean, as an e-commerce company, you don't have logistics, and then they, you know, before they have to rely on other logistic companies. And of course, you know, set, uh, customer consumer satisfaction is really low. So then, you know, they decide to build their own logistic, uh, logistic team, to to basically to. Uh, so they actually they, they spend like the last ten years to building up the whole ecosystem. I think we're facing the same thing. If the ecosystem is not ready at all. So if you are you don't have a vision to build a great company, you will give up. I mean, we already have com competitors give up. <laughs> you know, co competitors copy us. You know, they have exact the same like colors and button, blah blah blah. After three months, they give up because it's not easy to do. If you don't have you know a, a, a direction for you to 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 drive to, or if you don't believe that you're creating value, you know your board is going to tell you, okay, this thing is not making money. Please figure something out, right? <laughs> Yeah. One more question. Oh, maybe not. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. All.